This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. How are you today? Today's a good day. How are you? I am happy it's Friday. Yay, Friday. Even though you listening, it may not be Friday. Probably won't be. But it is for us today. Every day is Friday. So welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode of Crimes and Consequences. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to us on. That would be wonderful. When you do that, you get notifications that we have a new episode out. That's right. And since you're listening to us right now, you probably want to know when our new episodes come out. Absolutely. I'm just going to assume that. I'm guessing. (laughs) Strictly theory. So the story I have today started on March 24th, 1986. On that day, two 15-year-old friends, Amy and Diana, she went by Diane, attended Riverside County High School in California. Amy and Diane left school early that day and stopped at a nearby Wiener Schnitzel restaurant. A what? A Wiener Schnitzel. Okay, all right. <laughs> Wiener Schnitzel. Wiener Schnitzel. Which is fun to say. It is fun to say. That's why I included it. <laughs> they stopped there for a soda and then they stopped at another restaurant, which is called Don Jose's, where Diane submitted an application for employment. After submitting the application, the girls were in an area that was adjacent to a 7-Eleven, and they were there waiting for Diane's boyfriend, David, to come pick them up. Before Diane's boyfriend showed up, however, a brown Toyota entered a nearby driveway, and Diane began talking to the driver. Shortly thereafter, Amy also joined the conversation. The driver told the girls that he had found a marijuana field, and he had a lady that was going to go with him, but it fell through. And he couldn't take another day off of work. And because the marijuana field wasn't his, he needed someone to watch the road while he went and chopped down some marijuana. So he's soliciting these girls he doesn't know to come with him out, I'm assuming, in some sort of countryside Mm -hmm. to man the road to make sure no one catches him cultivating marijuana. Yes. Okay. I'm with you. He said he only needed one of them to go. And it would only take about an hour, and he offered to pay $1,000 for the help. No. The answer (laughs) is no. No, thank you. (laughs) Fuck no. Doesn't sound like anything I'd want to be a part of, but... But how old were they? 15. Okay, there you go. Sounded like an adventure. Right. I'm sure my dumb ass would have done it. (laughs) I'm just saying. (laughs) Tell the truth, my dumb ass probably would have too. The girls decided that if one of them was going to go, they both were going to go, so they both got in the car. Amy noticed an orange towel on the dashboard. She told Diane, oh, David's going to kill us for doing this, because remember, David was supposed to come and pick them up. Her boyfriend, right? Yeah. And the man said, will he kill you for making $1,000 in an hour? Why would he kill you for making $1,000? Yeah. I mean... He'll be happy. It's a good reason. They drove about 30 to 40 miles, and they stopped at a Circle K store because the driver said he was thirsty. That's a far drive. Yes. 30 or 40 miles is far. Why didn't he get somebody closer? You'd wonder, right? I would. The man returned to the car with a six-pack of Budweiser beer in bottles. Oh, shit. Yeah, we're going to have a party. The three drank the beer. The man told the girls that he was going to need bags to put the marijuana in, and it wouldn't be cool to put them in white plastic bags that they needed, like, paper grocery store bags. So he sent Amy back into the store to get some paper bags. They then drove to a thrifty store where they got more bags. Then they traveled to a hardware store, because the man said that the marijuana was thick and he needed to get a hatchet. No. Oh. I know, to chop it with. So they're getting bags and hatchets Mm -hmm. and going out to the woods. To a field 
To a field. Yes. The man went in the store to buy the hatchet, but he came back out without one. And he told the girls the hatchet cost $15, which was too much money. He didn't want to pay that. But he's paying them 1000 I know. <laughs> okay. And he told them, it's okay because I have a screwdriver in the trunk. Oh, shit. Diane then responded that she had a knife if he wanted to use it. And she gave him a small buck knife that she kept in her purse. She gave it to him? She gave it to him. That was probably her only form of protection. I know. And Amy didn't like that she did that. And so the man gave the knife back to Diane. The trio then drove for a while on the freeway, exiting near a field. The man tried to drive the vehicle into the field, but he wasn't able to do so. He told the girls that he knew another way to get in, and they kept driving. The car proceeded on a dirt road near a sign that said 80 acres for sale, and it passed a Volkswagen car shell, and I'm picturing like one of those Volkswagen bugs, like just the body of it. That's where the car stopped. Everyone got out, and the man took the bags out of the trunk. He told Amy to watch the road while he and Diane harvested the weed. But before leaving, the guy took a piss on the side of the road. Oh, that's classy. I know. And while he was doing that, the girls agreed that they were going to call out to each other to make sure everything was okay. But after a few minutes, the man and Diane returned, and the man told Amy that the marijuana patch wasn't there. They returned to the car and drove to where the dirt row stopped at a dead end. Then the man and Diane walked up a dirt path while Amy stayed behind in the vehicle. Diane had her knife with her. Amy waited for about 15 to 20 minutes, and she was picking the label off of her beer bottle. She started calling Diane's name, but she didn't get any response. She got out of the car. She noticed a bumper sticker on the back of the man's vehicle, and it read skier. She also noticed the license plate holder said the words, have a nice day. At some point, the man came back to the vehicle and he was alone. He told Amy that Diane was cooling her feet in a spring and that he needed Amy's help to carry down the bags. So he left the bags of weed with Diane. And come on, Amy, let's go into the field. Amy followed him up the trail. He said that he saw a snake, so he picked up a rock. Oh, boy. Amy said, well, give me the rock. The man did, saying, but I'll have to get another one. You don't want me to get killed, too, do you? So Amy gave the rock back to the man. Approximately at the same time when she's giving the rock back to the man, Amy saw Diane's body partially clothed and lying face down. Oh, that had to be terrifying. Oh, right? My God. Oh, yeah, she was terrified. She turned around to start running back down the path, but the man chased after her, hitting her in the back with the rock, which caused her to fall down. He started punching Amy in the face, and then the two fell into like a little gully that was there. Amy pleaded with him to let her hear Diane say something. The man repeatedly told her to shut up, that Diane was unconscious and unable to speak. Then he said, quote, you're kind of funny, kid. I'm about to rape you, and all you can do is think about your friend, end quote. Damn. At some point, they stood up because the man stood behind Amy, tore her blouse, pulled up her skirt, and ripped off her panties. She noticed that his trousers were down, and he was holding his penis, slapping it back and forth. Oh, God. I know. Angrily, he told her, turn around, don't look at me. But Amy continued to glance back at him. And he said, it's hard for me to get it up after I just got it on with your friend. Oh. I know, he's gross. The man attempted to sodomize Amy. Repeatedly unable to achieve penetration, though, he turned Amy around, asking her, quote, how are you at giving head, kid? She's 15. I know. He pushed her down on her knees, telling her, do it. And he shoved his penis into her mouth. After he got an erection. He turned Amy around again, began biting her neck, and then he was successful, and he sodomized her. Are you trying to tell me he anally raped her? Yeah, he anally raped her. Amy asked the man if he was going to kill her. He said, I've done this in people's houses, and I've never killed anyone yet. Oh, that's reassuring. 
Then he dragged Amy back up the path toward Diane's body, telling her she better shut up or he was going to get the Vaseline. What? Yeah. What? I know, it's so gross. While he was dragging Amy along, he picked up the square little jar of Vaseline. He applied it to himself, and when I mean himself, I mean his penis. He had Vaseline with him? He had Vaseline! In the field or woods, wherever this is? I know. And that's when he vaginally raped her. Amy asked him again if he was going to kill her. He said, I'm just going to knock you out. I'm going to hit you in the back of the neck with a rock. Amy said, why don't you just tie me up, dig a hole, and put me in the hole? What? I don't, I know, that scares me more than hitting me in the head with a rock. He said, okay, it's a good idea to tie you up. So he did that with her blouse and her bra. Then he told Amy he had to find Diane's knife, but he couldn't find it. So he came back to Amy saying, your friend was an asshole. She called me a few names and I think she's dead. Amy said, you don't have to kill me. And he again said, I'm just going to knock you out, which will give me time to get away. Amy said, please don't hurt me. I was abused as a child. She made this up, by the way. I was abused as a child and, you know, I got hit a lot. Please don't hit me. So upon hearing this, his attitude softened slightly. He said he understood what Amy had gone through because he said he was raped himself by three black men. And he's really sorry he had to do this, but, you know, he had a shitty day. That's his excuse? Mm Mm-hmm. He had a shitty day. Amy promised that she wasn't going to tell anybody. Like, she just continued to say, I'm not going to say anything. So he untied her and took her back down the trail, repeatedly saying, you made me hurt my hand. Amy noticed that his hands were really dirty, kind of like they were stained permanently. But fearing for her life, Amy asked the man to hold her hand. And instead, he put his arm around her and continued to tell her how sorry he was that he did this. He and Amy went back to the car, and they drove away. When Amy asked whether she could tell someone about where Diane was, he said, you can't do that. This is what you're going to tell them. You're going to tell them it was a black guy and that he took you, you know, if you have to tell them anything. He then told her that he was putting 15 years of his life in her hands because maybe that was the sentence for rape back then. So Amy again promised, I'm not going to tell anybody. How's she supposed to explain this away? I know. Diane, dead. Right. Where'd Diane go? But I'd be saying the exact same thing. I'm not telling a soul. I'm not telling a soul. I really won't. The man dropped Amy off approximately one block from where the 7-Eleven store was, where they got picked up. As Amy got out of the car, the man again said, don't call the police. Absolutely not. Nope. But he gave her a quarter to call home. Isn't that chivalrous? Right. He's such a gentleman. Then he drove off. Amy immediately called her sister, telling her exactly what happened. The sheriff's department was contacted And Amy later accompanied detectives to search for Diane. That day, the sheriff's deputies that went with Amy were Detective Richard Moker. And they went to where she thought she last saw Diane's body. They tried to retrace the route that the driver had taken. And it really relied upon Amy's description of the stores they had visited and distinctive road signs she had seen and the crime scene terrain. Yeah, because you said she was like 30 miles or 40 miles away from home, right? Right. I'm sure she had no idea where she was. At approximately 11 p.m. that day, after searching nearly six hours, the officers finally found the Volkswagen shell. So they know they're close. Shortly thereafter, they found some empty beer bottles, and fearful that the guy was lurking about, Amy asked, are you guys armed? And they're like, yep, yep, don't worry, you're okay. Because she was starting to get antsy, and she just wanted to leave. I'd be scared to death oh my if God, that was me too. her. She's only 15. And they're bringing her back to the crime scene. Yes. And this is like right after they've been searching for hours, but she's still just been raped. She then described to them where Diane's body could be found, and they ended up finding her. Thereafter, one of the officers took Amy to the hospital so that a rape kit could be performed on her. When they found Diane's body, 
It was bloodstained. She was nude below the waist, and her panties were wrapped around one of her legs. There was her buck knife with the blade extended near her, a shoe impression, another beer bottle, and paper grocery bags. I wonder why that killer said he couldn't find the knife if it was just by her. Right. It's bizarre. And I wonder why they got these stupid bags. Yeah. Just to go along with the story? Maybe. Just weird. Farther away from Diane's body, officers found four different tire impressions and a shoe impression at the spot where Amy said the driver had parked the vehicle. They found a white plastic sack containing empty beer bottles. There was beer bottles all over the damn place. They found the beer bottle that Amy had picked the label off. They also found Amy's torn underwear. While Amy was at the hospital, she was examined by Dr. Claire MacArthur, who was an emergency room physician at Riverside General Hospital. During her exam of Amy, she found a large bruise on Amy's upper back, abrasions on both knees, and a bruise to Amy's perineum, which for those of you who don't know, it's the area between the rectum and the vagina. It's your private parts. Dr. MacArthur also found sand-like particles in Amy's vagina <gasps> that she said could only have been there if there was penetration. The doctor that performed the autopsy on Diane, his name was Dr. DeWitt Hunter. The autopsy showed that the cause of Diane's death was major trauma to her head that led to massive cerebral contusions and hemorrhage. Her body also exhibited minor trauma in other locations. Dr. Hunter noticed that Diane had been sexually assaulted. She suffered several crush-type lacerations and a skull fracture, most likely caused by a rock or brick-like instrument. Her face also had numerous contusions and abrasions. So she'd been beaten. Mm -hmm. They said that was consistent with her head, like having been pushed into the dirt. Oh. Yeah. She wasn't stabbed? Mm-mm. He had that buck knife I available, know. and instead he just smashed her head with a rock yes. repeatedly? Yes. On the front of her pelvic bone, there were abrasions consistent with someone having kneeled or sat on her back. Her knees, elbows, and buttocks also showed abrasions. There was a reddening of the vaginal area consistent with the application of force and there were abrasions and ill-defined contusions on her upper and lower thighs. Ill-defined contusions? I know. That's what it said in the report, right? So the doctor's saying, like, her legs were pried apart. Oh. Although they didn't find any seminal fluid on her body or clothes, a Vaseline-like substance was found around her vaginal area and in her thighs. What the hell is wrong with this guy? <sighs> it's so gross. This poor girl. Literally is prepared to rape. Yes. I mean, he's got Vaseline. Yes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Before I tell you more of the story, we're going to take a break. And we're back. On May 4th, 1986, which is about six weeks after Diane and Amy were attacked, a car matching the description that Amy gave of the car the man was driving was spotted by Sergeant Ronald Wade. He worked for the Riverside Police. The vehicle was a brown Toyota Corolla, and it was parked next to a mobile home in the Mead Valley area. Sergeant Wade returned the next day and saw that the vehicle had some distinctive markings, like the bumper sticker that said skier, and there was a license plate frame that said, have a nice day. Why did he come back the next day? I mean, those are... Telltale signs it's the killer's car. I couldn't figure out why he came back the next day either. Why didn't he just investigate? But I'm sure he had his reasons. Sergeant Wade then knocked on the door of the mobile home, and a man who identified himself as Joe Hart answered the door. Sergeant Wade asked Joe where he was on March 24th. Joe told him that he was at work. So Sergeant Wade said, well, where do you work? And He was working at a place that was only a four-minute drive from the spot where Diane and Amy had been picked up. By that 7-Eleven? Yes. Sergeant Wade finishes his interview, and he goes back to the Riverside Sheriff's Department. He contacts the California Department of Justice for the purposes of getting Joe's criminal history and his fingerprints. 
Surprise, surprise, everyone. Joe's fingerprints matched those that the police got on the beer bottles at the crime scene. Detective Lackey, he was one of the detectives that accompanied Amy to the field when they found Diane. He visited Joe at his mobile home on May 7th, so a few days later. Why isn't this guy arrested? I know. I don't know. And he got consent from Joe's wife to examine the brown Toyota that was parked in the driveway. Detective Lackey brought with him photographs of the tire impressions that he found. And remember I told you they found four tire impressions? Well, they ended up being different impressions. So when Detective Lackey looked at this car, he noticed that each tire was different. Oh, so each one of those impressions was from a different tire. A different tread, yes. A different tread. Yes. And Joe had four different tires on his car? Yes. I bet he was not happy with his wife. (laughs) Right. For giving consent. Sure, come on in. She doesn't have anything to hide. Except an asshole husband. Right, seriously. Detective Lackey noticed there were lots of beer bottles strewn about the yard. I can only imagine what this yard looked like. He also saw cigarette butts, and Amy had told the officers that the driver had smoked Marlboro 100s. Detective Lackey also saw an orange towel that was located in a planner that was attached to the mobile home. And there was an orange towel in the car, right? That yes. Amy had seen. Yes. So I don't know why, but there just wasn't enough evidence yet. But Detective Lackey went back to the station and he got a search warrant the next day, May 8th. And the search warrant was for the mobile home now. Wouldn't they be able to do a photo lineup with Amy? Yeah, they do do one. By the time Detective Lackey got to the mobile home, there were police officers already there and they had arrested Joe and taken him into custody. Besides the items that I told you about, the beer bottles and the cigarette butts, police did collect blood and pubic hair samples from Joe which matched evidence taken from both Amy and Diane. Amy attended a lineup on May 12th. I don't know why it was so long after. This is literally like seven weeks after her attack, in which she observed five different individuals. Upon recognizing Joe, Amy gestured in his direction, and she immediately grabbed her mouth, like, as to keep herself from yelling, like, you know, that surprise. She began to cry, and she ducked down on the ground below the one-way mirror. PTSD. Yes. Her emotional state when she saw him was described as very distraught by the detectives who were present. And after the lineup, attendees, I don't know what to call them, left the room, Amy began to cry just uncontrollably. After she regained her composure, she said, it's number two. He killed Diane. He killed Diane. During Joe's trial... Many witnesses were presented for the prosecution. Do we know anything about Joe besides him being married? No, I don't know a whole lot about Joe, and there really is not a lot on the internet. One witness that I'm just going to note that the prosecution called was Joe's father-in-law. His name was Kenneth. He testified that Joe often wore baseball caps that had the letter C-A-T on them. I think that's construction equipment, like a brand name. He further testified that at some point prior to Joe's arrest, he saw Joe put two pieces of plywood in front of his car and a third on top, leading Kenneth to believe that Joe was trying to hide it. He also testified that a yellow sticker that read, Caution, Child in Car, was placed in the rear window of the vehicle shortly before Joe was arrested. So is he trying to throw off? Like Like it's a whole different car now? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I know. All right. Because you got like a baby on board sign. I'm not going to arrest you. Okay. Joe's defense called Amy as its initial witness and questioned her regarding the events of March 24th. Amy acknowledged that she willingly went with Diane in Joe's car for the trip to locate a marijuana patch. She also acknowledged misleading officers at first informing them that Diane might have known the perpetrator because she just didn't want to get them in trouble. She initially lied and said the perpetrator was a black man. She did. Mm -hmm. I think she was just scared. And on cross-examination, she confirmed that neither she nor Diane knew Joe. They had a deputy testify at the trial for the defense. 
He was one of the officers that showed up at the 7-Eleven when Amy had called. Initially, she told them that she had seen Diane's body laying on her back, even though she was laying on her stomach. The defense is really trying to just poke holes in her story because of the discrepancies. But the prosecution did make sure that Amy admitted on the stand that, yes, she did give a false description because she was scared that the man was going to come after her, Joe. She did say he was wearing one of those CAT baseball caps. So that's why I think the prosecution had his father-in-law testify. I wonder if that stands for Caterpillar. Oh, maybe. While Amy was testifying, she was crying, trembling, emotionally upset, and very distraught. Joe didn't testify for his own defense, and the prosecution offered no rebuttal. Well, what are you going to say? Right. In the closing argument to the jury, his defense counsel did admit that Joe took the girls to the remote area and assaulted them, and he admitted to killing Diane. He urged the jury, though, to conclude that Diane had been killed in the course of Joe having committed or attempting to commit sodomy, not rape and that the evidence supported no more than a verdict of second-degree murder. Because apparently, if you're committing this in the middle of a rape, it's worse. At the conclusion of the guilt phase of his trial, the jury found Joe guilty of having committed first-degree murder, rape, sodomy, and oral copulation, and found true the special circumstance allegation that the murders were committed during the commission of rape and sodomy. During the penalty phase of the trial, The prosecution introduced evidence of five prior offenses committed by Joe, in addition to evidence of the subsequent uncharged murder of his own 11-year-old niece. What? I'm going to tell you a little bit about his previous crimes. In February 1973... So this was, what, 13 years earlier? Yes. There was a woman who lived next door to the parents of Joe's first wife. Her name was Deborah. While Deborah was partially dressed one morning, he appeared in her kitchen. He said he had locked himself out of his house next door and asked to use her telephone. She repeatedly told him, you need to leave. Yeah. Get out of my house. And then suddenly he attacked her and started choking her. They fell to the floor. And during the struggle, Deborah bit Joe's hand, causing it to bleed. When the struggle ended, Joe told her that he just couldn't stop himself from entering people's homes. Oh, fucking, fucking weirdo. Well, well, what, oh, okay. What are you supposed to do with that? I know. Oh. Oh, okay. That's a problem. And that's 13 years earlier? Mm-hmm. So what the fuck did he do for 13 right. years, Tanya? Right. Deborah, bless her heart. She arranged for Joe to talk to one of the ministers at her church. No. Yes. No. Yes. But the minister contacted the local police who arrested Joe. During the search of his person, when they arrested him, they found a knotted piece of rope, 42 inches in length, a pocket knife, a piece of electrical wire that was 39 and a half inches in length, and a key to Deborah's house. Wow. And that's how he got in. Creepy, right? How to get a key to her house? I have no idea. Around this same time, on February 22nd, 1973, so this is the same month, Priscilla, who was 18, was employed as the manager of an apartment complex located in Imperial Beach. At dusk, a man asked her to show him an apartment. Once inside, he grabbed her and the two fell to the floor in a struggle. She repeatedly screamed, and he ran out of the apartment. She reported the incident to the police, initially identifying someone else as her attacker. Joe was questioned at a later date about some of the other crimes I'm going to tell you about, and when he was talking about those crimes, he admitted to attacking Priscilla with the intent to rape her. On January 19, 1975, a woman named Valerie was walking to her home. That so was this is two years later. Two years later which was also located at Imperial Beach, after having dinner at a restaurant. A man grabbed her from behind and placed one hand over her mouth and telling her not to scream. He pulled her into an alley and removed his hand off of her mouth. She immediately screamed, of course, right? So he took his knife and he placed it at her throat. He ordered her to remove her pants 
When she refused, he did it himself and telling her, don't look at me. She refused? Yes. Damn. I know. Gutsy. Gutsy. He also ripped open her blouse and he got on top of her and he may or may not have completed penetration because she said she wasn't sure. But he tried. But he tried. And this is all just in an alley. Yes. Even though she said she wasn't sure if he penetrated her, she did say she felt wetness. Oh. So, and she said it wasn't her. A few months after the incident, about the time period when Joe admitted to the police that he had attacked her. So this is one of the crimes he admitted to when he said he attacked Priscilla. Valerie identified him in a police lineup. About a month later, on the evening of February 26, 1975, a woman named Marilyn went dancing and she returned to her Imperial Beach apartment around 1 a.m. After falling asleep on the couch, she woke to find a man standing next to her. Terrifying. I know. His hand was covering her mouth and neck area. So I'm thinking maybe one was on her neck and one was on her mouth. He had a ski mask on. Oh, Lord, stop. That has to be stop it. doubly terrifying. Oh, it's like seriously a nightmare. I know. When they got those masks. Oh, oh. so creepy. He removed his hand from her neck and he had a pocket knife in his pocket. And he told Marilyn not to make any sudden moves or she was going to get hurt. He then taped her mouth shut and said, don't scream. He had tape? He had tape. If you tell me you had Vaseline, we're going to have to just stop <laughs> recording. No, there's no Vaseline. Maybe. I mean, I forget the story a little bit. After he taped her mouth shut, he began to fondle her breasts and he attempted to pull her pantyhose off. The tape became loose that was over her mouth. And in the hopes of preventing a rape, she told him that she was on her period and that she had a sexually transmitted disease. Smart. Smart. Because period, I would be like, I don't know if that would work with a rapist, but right. mm, I think mm. twice with syphilis. Or... I know. <laughs> right? I'm just saying. The man then forced her to give him a blowjob. And when he ejaculated, he forced her to swallow it. Sick. I know. He thereafter asked her for money. Like, can you give me some money? Marilyn said that she didn't have much and that she had a young son that she had to raise. The man told her he had keys to all the apartments in the complex and warned her not to contact the police, or he was going to kill her and her son. Did he have keys? I don't know. That's a good question. That reminds me of our Patreon episode, No Force Entry, with Richard Grissom, the serial killer. Remember, he was that painter for multiple apartment complexes, and he had multiple master key sets for different complexes. Oh, what a creeper. That's how he would get them. I remember. Yeah, multiple women. Because that's terrifying. Anyway, that reminded me of that. It reminded me, too. So this is the second time you said he either had a key or said he had a key, right? Right, right. Marilyn didn't see his face because he had the ski mask on the whole time, so she wasn't able to identify him to police. About a week later, however, he was being questioned by the police in connection with an attempted burglary that I'm going to tell you about in a second. And that's when he admitted that he attempted rape on Marilyn, explaining to the police that he had gone to her apartment complex for the purpose of committing a rape. Seems like they're doing a lot of questioning of him and not a lot of arresting. I know. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, he's saying he did all this. How come he's not being arrested? You tell me. I don't know. This is your story. I don't know. The attempted burglary was on March 5th, 1975. That's when police responded to a telephone call from a woman named Deborah. She said there was a possible prowler at the Imperial Beach Apartments. A possible prowler at the Imperial Beach Apartments. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. That was good, though. You did a really good job with Thank that. Thank you. He probably lives in Imperial Beach. That's what I'm thinking. That's where she lived. Police found Joe, barefoot, 30 to 40 feet from her apartment, walking away at a fast pace, and they detained him. Like, la, 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 la. Yeah, trying to not look suspicious, but walking very, very fast. Although Deborah wasn't able to identify him, fingerprints lifted from a window screen at her apartment matched those belonging to Joe. 
Joe waived his Miranda rights and gave the investigating officers a few different explanations as to what he was doing in that apartment complex that late at night. And it was about midnight. Just checking to make sure all the women single have their windows locked. I know, right? He denied that he had ever been near Deborah's window. So I don't know how his fingerprint possibly got there. The next day, he was reread his Miranda rights, and he confessed that he opened the window with the intent of raping Deborah. During the interrogation, he also described his involvement in other cases that I've told you about. The last previous crime, quote unquote, that the prosecution mentioned during Joe's trial happened on May 3rd, 1986. So this was after he had killed Diane and raped Amy, but the day before that officer spotted his car. Wow, okay. On May 3rd, the body of Joe's 11-year-old niece, Sheila, was found under a mattress, trash bags, and a rock overhang at a garbage dump located in Mead Valley. Just dumped there like a piece of trash? I know, that breaks my heart. I hate hearing stories where they're dumped like trash. I mean, they're all bad, but... His niece? His niece. She had been stabbed numerous times in the neck. A thin rubber molding was wrapped loosely around her neck, and her hands had been tied behind her with a plastic cable tie. Her forearms had marks on them that appeared to have been made by handcuffs. Handcuffs? I know. Her shirt was ripped and pulled away from her chest. A semen stain was found on her pant leg. Sheila had lived next door to Joe and had been missing since early that morning. In the ensuing few days, Joe was seen using a tractor to grade his backyard. He told some people that he was doing landscaping work. The day that Joe was arrested for the crimes committed against Diane and Amy, that was May 8th, pursuant to a search warrant, police searched around the mobile home and in it, and they located cable ties similar to the ones they found binding Sheila's wrists, as well as two sets of handcuffs buried under freshly turned soil within a shed located behind his mobile home. An acquaintance of Joe's named William testified that in early 1986, he engaged in a lighthearted discussion with Joe regarding women in bondage. Okay. Two guys just joking around. That led Joe to produce three sets of handcuffs from the trunk of his car, and he told William something to the effect of, this is what you need. He just has handcuffs in his trunk. I mean, hey, buddy, I'm just no. curious. We, you keep handcuffs in your trunk. I don't right. have any in mine right now. Do you? Uh, No. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> There were traces of blood found on one set of the handcuffs that were recovered in the blood-matched Sheila's. There was a fiber that was collected from the handcuffs similar to the fabric of the black t-shirt that Sheila was wearing. There was some other forensic evidence they collected that matched Joe, like there was a fiber from his car and things like that, but I'm not going to go into it. The coroner who performed the autopsy on Sheila's body said that she had been stabbed 16 times. The cause of death was a cut to Sheila's carotid artery. There were bruises and other abrasions, and Sheila had breasts that were fully developed, more than someone 11. And during the trial, when this medical examiner was cross-examined, he said he didn't find any evidence that showed that Sheila was sexually assaulted, but it doesn't mean that she wasn't. I'm sure he did something to her. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he did. Since the key component to all of his crimes appears to be sexual. Yes, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about what he told a guy that he shared a jail cell with. Oh, boy. I love it when they just open their mouths up to their cellmates. This cellmate was named Randy. He testified at the trial that Joe admitted to murdering his niece and leaving her body at a dump. Randy also said Joe described her as an 11-year-old with big breasts and built a lot sexier than an 11-year-old was. Gross. Randy said that when Joe discussed killing Sheila, he made stabbing motions and laughed as he acted out the killing. Joe told him that he killed the girl because he was nervous after having talked to her about his other sexual assaults. What? And that he had made sexual advances toward her. So he had to kill her. So he was totally creeping on his niece. 11. 
She's like in sixth grade. Joel told Randy he really liked Sheila and didn't want to kill her, Mm -hmm. but it's easier after you've done it. And I think that was probably referring to Diane. While watching television with Randy, Joe would compare the breasts of women on television with those of his niece. And he expressed concern to Randy that the sheriff's deputies that were searching his backyard, that they were going to find evidence that could connect him to Sheila's murder. He is such a rat bastard. Oh my God, I can't stand him. I know. I can't stand him. Finally, after all this evidence is presented, at the penalty phase, Joe is sentenced to death in the first degree killing of Diane. He appealed his death sentence, of course, by saying he wasn't given a fair and impartial jury during the trial and several jurors should have been disqualified. Blah, blah, blah. I know. He said his counsel was ineffective mm-hmm. and more reasons, but as you blah, blah, it's too boring to talk about. He did it. But one reason I am going to tell you, because I was completely grossed out by it. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> he stated that He stated that the evidence relating to the sexual offenses was insufficient, and it really pissed me off, like saying he didn't rape Amy or Diane. The appeal made it all the way to the California Supreme Court, and in the end, they affirmed his conviction and sentence. Joe's ass is still in death row. You want to guess where? Club San Quentin? (laughs) The fine California resort known as... San Quentin. And we haven't done a San Quentin story in a while. So that is my disgusting story of Joe Hart and the murder of Diane and his poor cousin Sheila and all the other girls and women he raped. Who knows how many out there. I know. Sicko. Diane couldn't have been his first murder. Not if he was doing all that shit at least 13 years Mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah, exactly. There's probably so many women that didn't come forward. Mm Mm-hmm. That, you know, we're raped by him. He's just a fucking asshole. I hope he rots. Anyway. He is. He's in San San Quentin. Quentin. Hanging out with all the other lovely fellas. (laughs) And death row. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And if you haven't, please hit the subscriber follow button on the app you're listening to us on. Pretty please with sugar on top. Absolutely. Do it. And if you want to find out. You need to do it. Go ahead. Do it. Do it. If you want to find out more information about this episode, visit our website. I don't have a lot of photos because there really isn't any to find. But we have a new domain name, crimesandconsequences.com. Makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So go there and not only check out information about this episode, but all of our other episodes. You can find us on social media at Hardcore True Crime. And if you just can't get enough. Just can't get enough. Of Talia and I, you can become a member or a subscriber. You can become a member on Patreon.com and you will have access to all kinds of exclusive episodes. We got all kinds of nasty ass stories. Mm -hmm. We do. (laughs) If you don't think these are nasty enough, there's a lot more. We save the worst ones for our (laughs) patrons because they like it. Bless their hearts. That's Patreon.com slash TNT Crimes. And if you don't want to go there and you guys have Apple Podcasts, I don't, but you do, right, I Tanya? do, yes. You can just go to our Apple channel and subscribe there. And you can just find it by Googling our podcast. And there's easy peasy subscribe button. So she says. I don't know. I promise. I'm an Android user. <laughs> we got some merchandise. We do. So check that out on our website. Yeah, we've got the Gruesome Scale t-shirt. That's the newest addition to our fall collection. Yes, we debuted it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's it. So until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Pretty please. Bye. Bye. Bye.